Hello everyone. Uh, my name is my name is Arno, uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, and we'll do a couple a uh, couple of things. We'll we'll talk about Monte Carlo for um, race simulation, uh, and we'll also talk about Monte Carlo for financial services. Um, and and the the demo we were, we were planning at first to do it on race simulation. We'll we'll have to do it on on financial simulation. Um, it's 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 almost exactly the same thing. Just just slight. The only difference will be will be on the the actual Python code that's running. Um, and so the the first thing uh, the first thing we're we're going to do uh, is to actually uh, go straight in or OCI console on your um, on the on the tenancy that that you created to to go and launch the cluster uh, and then we'll go back to this presentation and while uh, while oracle cloud is launching everything in the background we'll um we'll go go over what we are going to do and how we're going to use it um and then uh, hopefully by by the time we're done uh, your cluster will be created and we can we can start launching some some simulations all right so let me actually um go to this page and then I'll, I'll, I'll do this uh, I'll do this live in front of you so um, if you go to cloudoracle.com to to your to your tenancy uh, we'll go to to the the menu I'll show you developer service okay we'll create a cluster uh, and then there's a wizard to do a, a quick creation that will do uh, a lot of the different things for you like setting up the network setting up all of the the security rules things like that so all of that will be done for you so you'll see it it, it will be very quick um, and then we'll we'll actually start with just one virtual machine with with a couple of cores, eight gigabyte of RAM, just just for one node. We'll use that for uh, for the rabbit um, for the for the queuing system for the load balancer and so on. And then we'll add uh, we'll add another uh, node pool later on for our uh, worker nodes. All right, let me uh, let me go to my console, uh, and if I go here. Uh, if you go to the menu, which is the, the little hamburger here on the top left, um, if you go to developer service, you can go to Kubernetes clusters, we call it OKE. So this is basically a, a cluster managed by, uh, by Oracle, uh, and we are going to do uh, what we call a quick create. Um, here, I'm going to call this by the demo. Um, I'm going to leave it in, in my compartment. Uh, you can choose the latest, you can leave the, the Kubernetes version, the latest one by default. We can do a public endpoint uh, so that you can, um, we can access, we can actually access your, the cluster um, through, a, through a public IP. Uh, here, uh, we can do either public or private worker. Here, we won't, we won't really have to, have to connect to those directly so we can, uh, we can leave private, uh, private worker. As I said, we can do just one virtual machine. Um, what's what's nice on, on Oracle Cloud is you can actually uh, create your machine as you wish with however many cores you want, however much, how much memory that you actually need on this virtual machine. Uh, and you actually, uh, on, on those, you're, you're built separately on the cores and on the memory. So you can make really, really fat node with uh, tons of memory, or you can make uh, nodes with really, with, um, with not much memory at all, which is what we'll do for worker nodes. Here, I think uh, we can do uh, maybe a couple of cores, uh, eight gigabytes of RAM, that's, that's good. We'll just do one node for now. Um, and we can just click on next and click on create cluster. Uh, and that's, that's going to go through this whole workflow uh, and have everything created, uh, creating, uh, and then we'll um, we'll be able to to go and and check check on our cluster. So if I go here, you'll see your cluster will be in creating mode, uh, and that can take uh, that can take a bit of time. So we'll um, we'll actually go back and and look at what what the demo will entail today. All right. Perfect. Um, something else, uh, you can feel free to, if you have questions or anything like this, feel free to, to post them in the chat uh, and, uh, and we'll try to answer them as, as much as possible. I'll try to, to monitor the chat as, as I see things, things coming, up, coming in. All right, let's go back to our uh, presentation. Um, trying to not to go too quickly uh, if, you, if you're following along and trying to do this, uh, to do this uh, as well. All right, so how do Monte Carlo simulation work? Uh, we actually have a, a pretty cool video here uh, that we can look at. 
basically how Monte Carlo simulation work is we have a lot of uncertainty on the on our input side. Uh, if you have a problem and you don't know, um, let's say you're you're doing uh, the, the example we want to take is, is race race strategy. Um, you don't know you don't know the weather. You don't know if someone's going to crash. You don't know if there's going to be a safety car. You don't know um, you know how how exactly how your tires are going to degrade. Like all of those little things, there is some uncertainty to it. Um, and if you do this simulation once, uh, you have one result. But if you do this uh, a million times and you keep doing it, uh, you'll get slightly different results. And if you look here at this video, if we have uh, here, we have a little square and we have a circle. And we're going to try to guess the value of pi uh, by randomly dropping those balls um, on the, on, onto, the, onto the, the square that you have here, the rectangle that you have here. Uh, and then we'll, we'll wait how many balls are in square, how many balls are in the round, in the round form shape. And, uh, and that way we'll be able to guess by. And we'll see that at first, we're pretty far off. Um, you see here, we are like pi six uh, or five, four, like it's, it's, it's very far away. As you increase your number of simulation, you're starting to get closer and closer and closer to the actual value of pi. And that's going to be the same thing for our simulation. We'll get, we'll get a, a certain value for a certainty on the output side, and then we'll get closer and closer and closer to the actual solution, as well as getting a distribution on the output side. So that, that's really uh, getting back to your, your static, statistic classes uh, and really understanding like what, um, what you're going to get on the output side. And your calculation model can be, can be anything. Um, it, it can be can be quite simple, as we've seen here with the with the pi calculation. It can be very complex with a lot tons of input variables and output variables, um, and we we just have to um, we just have to run this enough time to get to get the right solution. All right. So how is Monte Carlo used in racing? Um, basically, the race strategy is used at, at two at two different times. One is before the race. Um, if, if a team is trying to guess how many laps they're going to do, they're going to run on on which set of tires, uh, what's going to give them the, the edge over the, the competitor? If they should start on soft tires, on medium tire, on hard tires, all of those decisions, uh, they will run the race strategy and they will run the race millions or billions of times, trying to take all of the all of the knowledge that they have uh, into account. Once they've decided on an initial strategy, um, they will go to the start line. As soon as the, as soon as the light goes out, um, everything, you, you basically have to start again because your position is now may, may not be the same uh, 100 meters after the start than, than when you just started. And so you will have to actually go back and rerun those simulation every lab um, to try to, to estimate like... Um, well, now there's no, in Formula One, there's no fuel levels anymore, but uh, depending on the race, depending on the regulation, your fuel level, you, the, how long it takes to pit, uh, the traffic, the tire wear, overtaking possibilities, weather, all of that. Um, and then you get all of the live data as well. So you have data streaming in with things like your, your exact position, uh, the gap that's with the, with the car in front, with the car behind, um, lots, of, lots of variables, lots of data that's coming in. And there is a model that's crunching it and say, uh, for let's let's run the simulation and and we'll run this billions of times. And if you if you watch Formula One, you know, for example, if a safety car comes on, some car crash, safety car comes on, you basically have one shot to stop at the pit. It's the next time you see the pit lane go in or don't, uh, and that's going to make a difference whether you uh, whether you. You went through the pit. You may have lost a few positions, but you're you're on clean tires. Or um, if you if the safety car comes on and you don't pit, you decide, okay, I'm good. I'm good as it is. I'm not taking any chance to to lose a position. But you're 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 stuck with your with your old tires. And if you've watched uh, the last F1 season, that's that's really where the race strategy was uh, was at its greatest. Because what we saw is a safety car coming on very last laps of the race one one driver decides to go in one driver decides not to go in 
Um, they all had the reason to do this or not, but ultimately you end up with a car with fresh tire against a car with really, really old tires and have one lap. And almost 100% of the time, the car with the, with the new fresh soft tires is going to be the, the car with the hard tires. Like the, the other driver had no chance. And so race strategy actually in the last season, if you look at it, 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 made, it made an impact on quite a few races. Uh, and and that's, that's why it's important. And that's kind of what, what we want to show today is how, how you can use Monte Carlo to, to do these simulations. And in finances, Monte Carlo is used is used as well. Uh, maybe even uh, that may be even a more common use case. Uh, not not a lot of people are doing uh, are doing race strategy calculation, but uh, there is a lot of people that are uh, that are assessing risk, uh, looking at, at portfolio valuation. Uh, if you whatever whatever you're doing, whether if there is a risk or or something, some uncertainty to estimate, uh, Monte Carlo is usually the way to go. I'm not going to go. Uh, in all of the all of the detailed uh, details ways where that's used, but uh, one one big one that you can look at is is just stock market, and knowing um, knowing kind of the trends, knowing uh, the the volatility of, of a stock and so on, you can you can kind of look at like where where am I, uh, what are the odds of me being up next month or next week or next hour, uh, depending what you're doing versus uh, odds of being down. Um, and like, what's what's my what's what value do I have at risk? Uh, all of those things uh, can can be evaluated as well. Um, I'm not going to go uh, too much into those details uh, within the lab, uh, but that's that's what we'll simulate in the in the in the small Python code that we're running. All right. Let's now uh, take a quick look at our architecture. How, how are we going to do this? Um, so first of all, um, to connect to anything, uh, to make this easy, we'll use what we call the cloud shell. Um, it's, it's just a small virtual machine that's available for anyone uh, in their tenancy, uh, where you can just use your, uh, your web browser to access and to run, uh, to run some command. You don't have to, uh, to actually go and, and set up a, Sort of a putty session if you're on Windows or SSH session, you can just access that from your web browser. That will that will be really handy to to connect to our cluster. Uh, in real life, obviously, uh, that there's probably going to be a, a whole a whole either a front office tool in, in financial simulation or a whole like kind of like data pre-processing in race strategy where, where people are going to est like to do some of the some work already uh, before actually launching some simulation. Uh, and then we'll go to our, uh, our load balancer. Uh, we'll actually start a service that will, be, or that will do the load balancing and, and submit jobs on, on one or the other nodes. Um, and we'll have a RabbitMQ container. Uh, and so the RabbitMQ will actually, it's just, it's a very simple uh, message passing interface. Well, well, message interface. So you have um, you have a simulation. You, you need a simulation to be done. You can submit a message to the queue saying, "Here are the few input parameters I want you to simulate," and it's just expecting a result. Um, all of our um, and then and then we'll go uh, we'll we'll go into the, the workers later on that are actually going to pull those messages and, and and run the simulation. So. Something else I, I may have forgotten to mention, we'll, we'll run all of this with uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and Kubernetes, as most of you know, is just um, basically some, some infrastructure around, um, around Docker containers. So we'll have a few Docker containers and Kubernetes will be kind of your scheduler. I'll make sure the right containers are running in the right spots, that, that those are spread out, like. And, and all of those things that are done correctly. So you can really see Kubernetes as managing all of your Docker containers uh, rather than you having to go into a specific node and say, I'm going to run this command on a specific node, this other node, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And Kubernetes is handling all of that for you. Um, and then finally, uh, there's going to be uh, a couple other things that we are going to do with, with the containers um, is that we'll, uh, we'll have the containers um, 
pull the messages. And so we'll do what we call a hot start, meaning the container are always going to be um, up and running and just waiting for messages from the RabbitMQ. Uh, another possibility, if you, if you know Kubernetes, if you were running batch, batch jobs, you could look at uh, every time you want to run something, you, you launch a job and you ask for a container to be uh, deployed and then run it and then uh, kill the, the container. The advantage of having all of those containers re ready to go is that it will go much faster. And when your simulation are, are lasting for seconds, even sometimes less, less than a second, uh, having to wait for your container to spin up uh, it is quite a, is a penalty that we, we're not really willing to, willing to take. And then the other thing that you can see in this plot is that we'll actually have workers and we'll have splitters. Um, and the splitters is that for a Monte Carlo simulation, and we'll say run this a hundred times, a thousand times, a billion times, however many numbers of simulation you're planning to run, the splitter will then take that thousand, thousand simulations that you have to run and split it in maybe in 10 or in hundreds uh, so that each worker can, uh, can actually uh, chew a small part of it. And then the splitter can aggregate all of those results together uh, and, and feed that back to your, um, to your tool. Uh, and that's, that has the advantage of being able to scale. If you have, uh, if you have simulation and lots of it, lots of simulation that you need to run, each container is going to be able to do a, a small, a, a small piece. Um, in our case, each container is actually going to run just on one core on, on the machine. Uh, and will, um, yeah, each, each of those cores will run some simulation, uh, and, and each node that will create will actually have, a, a multiple parts that are going to run this simulation. All right, let me uh, quickly see if there's, yeah, okay, perfect. Nothing in the chat that's, uh, that I need to take care of. All right, so uh, now we'll go back to a cluster and set up our ARM node pool. Um, and, oops, I hope I can copy this from here. No, I may have to exit full screen for a second. All right. Um, let me actually uh, paste this in the chat for everyone because you may uh, you will need to uh, you will need this, this for your um, for your ARM uh, containers. All right, the rest you can you can all click. But uh, basically, here we have our uh, our cluster. We have a node pool. Uh, if you look here, we have a the, our default pool that, that we created, which is uh, if you go here and click on nodes you'll see that there's one node ready and, and active. So perfect. Um, we'll, we'll be able to do a few things with that already. The, uh, the first thing we'll do here uh, is add a second node pool. Uh, and here we'll add an ARM uh, node pool. Um, here we can select uh, standard.a1.flex. So that's how, that's how those are, are named. A1 uh, is for Ampere ARM. Um, and we'll do maybe three nodes with eight cores and we'll take the minimum amount of memory, which is eight gig gigabytes of memory. We'll select three nodes, that's great. Uh, placement configuration, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't say this, but you're, you're going to run this in a region. Some region have multiple what you call availability domain. Uh, I'm just gonna pick one uh, and run this in my private subnets, which is where the, the nodes are supposed to go. Uh, so make sure you have your node subnets uh, and not, not in the K8 API endpoint. So your subnet needs to be OK node subnet and in your availability domain. And in the advanced options, um, we'll actually paste what I pasted in the chat, the cloud init scripts. Um, I wonder... I'm not gonna need to get those on different lines. All right, so that's, uh, that's the script that we are actually going to run. Uh, we can leave everything else as uh, defaults. And then add this, uh, this second, uh, second pool. All right. 
Now, uh, while, while this is spinning up, we are actually going to access our cluster. Um, and if you, uh, if you select here, access cluster, um, you can do a local access. Uh, so if you have a virtual machine, you can actually connect to it. Uh, but we'll do Cloud Shell access and we'll uh, go here, copy, copy the command that we'll need to, to paste in our Cloud Shell. And we'll say here, launch the Cloud Shell. And we can close this. And this is going to create uh, a small virtual machine uh, that, that you'll be able to use to, to connect to it. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, it seems like I didn't send the cloud init script to everyone. This is now uh, not in the chat. Perfect. I, I give you I give you a few minutes uh, to get that done. Uh, you see here basically this cloud shell, uh, just a small small terminal. Uh, in my case, I'm going to make a directory by the demo. By day. And I'm going to cd to that directory. Um, and it's not, yeah, this one is now empty. All right, let me, uh, let me go back to my uh, presentation for a second. Um, what, we'll, what we'll do now is that we'll actually run, uh, we'll connect to our uh, OK cluster. Uh, and so here is we'll, we'll grab this. Uh, I want to copy this, but I'll have to go back out of presentation mode. I'm going to copy this and put it in the chat as well. All right. So here we can do a uh, wget of this, uh, this zip file and we can unzip main.zip. We won't need uh, a lot of those files. We'll actually won't need it, but uh, we'll just uh, we'll just download this. This is from a, this is from a GitHub repo, so you could actually also just just clone that repo here. Uh, it's whatever is the easiest for you. Uh, Git is also installed on the on the on the cloud on the cloud shell. All right, CD to OCI Monte Carlo simulation FSI. Uh, if you ls here, uh, there's going to be a KS8 deployment folder here with a few um, with a few servers that will uh, that will be, that will run. Um, first thing first, uh, we'll go back. So if I go to access cluster, I'm not sure I still have this copied, but let me copy copy this um, copy this command again. Uh, make sure I'm connected to my cluster. Just paste it. All right, and if I do a cube CTL, which is a cube control, is how you how you access your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Cube CTL, you can do a uh, get nodes, for example. And you see here right now, I have only um, one node. It's my AMD node that I had initially. Uh, I don't have my uh, ARM node pool uh, up yet. The nodes are uh, probably still still coming up. Yeah, still installing software. So the, the others are, are going to come as well. Um, that's okay. There's there's tons of things that that we can do already while those nodes are those nodes are coming up. So if we do a cube CTL, uh, we'll create uh, a few a, a few services. Um, and if we look here in the presentation. There is three that we'll do. We'll do the RabbitMQ controller, the RabbitMQ service, and then the load balancer service. All right, so we can do RabbitMQ controller. Sorry, 
evident view uh, service. And then we'll have the cube CTL create max F for uh, or load balancer. All right. Um, We'll give it uh, give it a few uh, a few seconds for all of those servers to uh, to start and to launch, um, and we'll be able to uh, to then go and look at it uh, by doing a, a cube control uh, get services, for example. So cube control get services. Uh, and we see here that we'll have a, a external IP uh, here uh, that, uh, that's, that's basically going to be our, our, load, uh, our load balancer. Uh, and, and one thing that we can do with this external IP uh, is that uh, if you paste it and go to port, I can grab it from here, but 15672, so 15672. Uh, this actually uh, gets you to the the Vabit queue that you the Vabit service that you created, and you can log on with uh, guest guest. Um, get out of this. So basically, this this will allow you to monitors uh, to monitor the queues that have been created. Right now, we have no queues. Uh, we'll have some that are going that can pop up once once we created it, uh, and so on. All right, perfect. Um, let me go uh, and take a look here. If my nodes are available. So we can do, uh, if we want to see uh, from kubectl, kubectl get nodes. Still not there. Uh, Pods, we should, you should only see one or rabbit controller. Uh, the other, the other part will, will, will get them later. Um, and then the kubectl get um, here will do uh, services. Uh, well, services we have it higher, a, a bit higher. So basically, yeah, you can monitor, uh, monitor what you have uh, and what what needs to be done. All right, then what will what we'll do as well uh, is that we are going to go and edit a few of the files for the other uh, other part that we want we want to do. So if you do a, a VI of your ARM uh, client, for example, um, here if you scroll down to the bottom, uh, reporting, um, we actually haven't activated. So in the lab, in the in the lab. If you go to the lab, there's a whole way of, of setting up uh, reporting with Splunk and all of those things. We, uh, we kept it easy for today. Uh, and so the reporting, uh, we can set this value uh, to one. Uh, and you see that uh, the node selector is actually going to run on ARM. Uh, in this case, we see that a few, uh, a few environment variables are set, like the rabbit and queue host, rabbit and queue, like the, the name of the queues, uh, and so on. All of that is available here. All right. Let me let me exit this one. Um, how are we doing on those nodes? It's taking a bit longer than expected. Yeah. Another cluster that I have, uh, this, when I tested this, it was working. Yeah. Let's give it a few more minutes. That will give everyone time to catch up. Uh, 
Uh, any any questions or comments up to this point? Perfect. Uh, yeah, if you have any, feel free to uh, feel free to post them uh, post them in the chat uh, as we said. All right. Um, so what we'll what we'll do now? Um, I'll, I'll go over. So we, we've done we've done step number one. So the, the client controller will have three three parts that we are going to run. Uh, there's going to be going to be the client, the splitter, and then the worker. The client will just have one. Uh, that's just where we are going to launch for simulation from. Uh, that should be uh, should be just just one part. Then the splitter and the workers here we can have uh, different numbers. For example, for our workers we can uh, put a replica number to ten. That means that whenever we deploy this, we ask for ten parts to be workers. And for the splitter, we can, for example, have three splitter uh, for our for our case. Where um, if we if we look at, I think we made three nodes of eight cores. So that'll be 24. Uh, so we could probably go actually even a, a bit larger, uh, a bit larger than that. We could probably have the worker be uh, be 20, uh, the splitter is three, and then the controller one, or something to that uh, to that order. And we'll create those uh, just the way we created the other the other services. We'll launch those those YAML files that you downloaded. We'll just edit them and then create this. All right. Let's see. Still installing software. Uh, that's worrying me a little bit because that's taking a bit longer. All right, let's already update the other and we'll see if we uh, just something. Uh, all right, so we can leave five for a splitter, that's fine. So we have uh, 24 minus five minus one. Uh, that'd be 18. So if we via arm worker controller. And uh, and what those um, what those pods are doing is that they're pulling an image from a public repo that we have, where we have all of this uh, compiled. Well, basically, we have the the Python code and everything uh, in in a Docker container, uh, and those YAML are going to just go and uh, and grab those. And if this takes a bit too long, I'm gonna have to jump to my other cluster to make sure. I can actually show you how it's going. All right, let me let me grab the other cluster. It's taking a bit too long. All right. So um, if I copy this now, I'm actually going to be in a cluster that I had already configured before. Uh, if I go get services. Um, we have some running with a different IP. And if I look at my pods, yeah, I have a bunch of them running. Let me let me delete some so that we are at the same point at what we were supposed to be. Yeah. So you can delay the same way you can create, you can also delete uh, using the file that you have. So uh, we can take, sorry, F. And remove client, Twitter, and I don't need the worker. In the same state that we were in before. Uh, pods. Uh, and what we can do as well uh, is that we can ask if you do minus O wide. Uh, you can, one of the good things here is that you'll be able to see which pod is running on which, uh, on which node. 
which IP basically. All right, so we have central box terminating. Let me see what it's done. All right, perfect. So only thing we have is our rabbit controller. We see it's running on node 10, 0, 10, 30. That's the, that's the node it, it, it's running on. And that's, our, that's actually our AMD node. Um, so now let me go QCPL, create um, arm client. Mm -hmm. F. And it goes for those the splitters. And then the word. And if you if you were to run this directly uh, directly on just just on AMD nodes, so here we we were running this we we're running this on on the ARM nodes, but if you grab the uh, Intel client Intel Spider, Intel worker uh, is the it would work exactly the same just running on the AMD nodes. So if you if you just want to go ahead and create one node pool with uh, with AMD cores, you can just run it run it just the same on those. Um, so that's. That's one of the advantage uh, of, of running this, uh, running the, this in the container is that uh, depending on which container you're running in, you can just grab one image or the other, but ultimately it's the same. Now, uh, some container now uh, with, with the Docker build, the, build X, uh, you can actually build a container that will support different images. Uh, and so depending on which, uh, which shape you're running on, you can pull the right, the right container. All right, perfect. Um, so now we have created our, uh, our pods. Let's go and take a look at them. We see they're all, uh, they're all running. Uh, and you see that none of them are running on the 10.30, which is the, the AMD nodes. They're either on the 254, on the 120, on the 138, which are our three ARM. Uh, and that comes because at the end of that YAML file, we were specifying this we needed to run on the ARM um, uh, ARM node, not on the AMD node. So. All right, now if I go back here, uh, yeah, that's yeah the information about how to access the value of Q, um, the actual GUI that they have. So we can go here and run this command. And let me actually paste this in the chat as well. All right. So this is the command that you'll run to uh, to go and access the client, uh, and you'll just have to change uh, the client name. So if I paste this uh, here, I'm gonna erase. Grab the name of my own client. And so that basically will give me access to my um, uh, to the to the node, to the client node that it, that will launch the simulation. Uh, so if I do a if I do a ls uh, in this, I'll see that I have uh, basically my Python code and then my simulation.json. If I look at the simulation.json, it, it's very simple. So again, I'm not going to go uh, go into the, the, the weeds here and too in too detail. But basically, we are running uh, we are running some portfolios uh, that have some risk, some volatility, some maturity, and so on. Uh, and what will the most important thing that we can change right now is the number of simulations. So if you look at the default, it's running a hundred simulations. And so uh, I can do, I can call Python three, my uh, main function, and then as argument, the simulation.json uh, file. 
Uh, if I just run this, it's going to run uh, very quickly. Uh, so if you look, it a lot of numbers, but you can actually go and, and remove that if you want. But we see here, it, it's printing like the RabbitMQ host, in which queue it's running, uh, the portfolio ID, start time, and it says here, I'm splitting it, and then I send it, I'm sending it to, uh, to the other queues, uh, and then there's some uh, tasks that are going to be uh, received and so on. Um, and if you go back at the end, you'll find uh, how long it took to compute the portfolio. In our case, it took 0.4 seconds uh, to run. Uh, if I go and I can go and edit my simulation JSON and look here, if you were to run 300 simulations and run it, and let me, I get, let me actually put that in the log. They'll log now. Let's tail just the last line. You see here that for uh, we multiplied this and now it took 1.3 seconds uh, to run. Uh, and this can actually, we can increase this again uh, and go, for example, here, number of simulation. Let me run a thousand of those. And a thousand. And see now this is it's starting to take uh, take a bit longer. Uh, see, it actually took um, eight seconds to run uh, to run this on on all of the nodes uh, and so on. All right, and so uh, and so that that that's basically it. Now we can we can go and, and look at a few uh, a few different things uh, on the on these clusters. Uh, so if if I go look at my uh, node pools here, uh, you can look at, at a few a uh, few of your metrics uh, on on of the on the nodes. Uh, I can go and look on specific nodes. You, you can get some some information. Uh, about the the CPU load, about all of those things, you can you can go and, and have a look at this. Uh, there are also uh, tools that you can use uh, to do this without uh, without OCI. Uh, so not looking at it on OCI, but actually looking at it uh, through OKE uh, OKE monitoring. Um, so that's. Uh, that's most of what I what I wanted to show here uh, in the demo. I uh, wanted to keep this short um, and show. Yeah, we can we can use we can use OKE uh, to do to do a lot of those things um, to have uh, to have basically Oracle handles a lot of the infrastructure for you. Just you just need to have your your Docker container ready. Uh, you create a rabbit a rabbit MQ service, and then you have your Docker uh, Docker images pulled from there. Uh, messages and and that's that's highly uh, that's highly efficient. So you can really run a lot of different um, a high number of simulation can actually run all at the same time uh, when you do this uh, and have a very quick turnaround. RabbitMQ is able to to handle thousands and thousands and thousands of message uh, messages second. So uh, it's it's really efficient for that. Uh, a few uh, few of the announcement announcement on the lab. Uh, so there is a there is some uh, there's a, a Pi knowledge quiz that you can go on uh, and and take uh, to to see to see how how well how well you understood some uh, some of those some of those things that you saw today. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, we have new Kubernetes service, so we uh, we haven't used. A lot of the of the feature of Kubernetes, but this is actually there's a lot more to it. Um, and now we are also uh, providing a declarative API and, and different tooling to simplify your provisioning, your upgrading, and operating of of all of your Kubernetes clusters. 
Um, so those are all uh, open source cluster API. Uh, the, the name is uh, CAPOCI to uh, to help to help you manage your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, to basically have command line access to do a lot of the things that we've done. Uh, it provides integration with all of your OCI service. Uh, so the networking, as we've seen, uh, load balancer, FSS, which, uh, which is a file system. Uh, it's a NFS file system that you can mount on all of your nodes uh, and then your, your blog volumes. Um, so you have your default implementation uh, with templates, uh, and then you have a Kubernetes image build builder uh, to create your custom OCI uh, compute images. Um, so yeah, that's uh, if you want. Uh, there is uh, there is a, a link here that I can uh, paste as well, uh, so that you can go and, and take a look at this. 